Good. So welcome everybody to VSET uh, seminars. It's a pleasure to have you again another week with us. Today we have Nathan Yoder from Georgia. He's going to talk about matching with the strategic consistency. Uh, it's a joint work with Marzena Rostec. And we have as guest panelists David De La Cretas and Ravi Jagadisa. So thank you for, for joining us. And uh, remember that the structure is that uh, uh, if there's any comment from the, from the audience, uh, usually we use the chat, but today there's no co-author. So I suggest that you just unmute and make the questions directly to, to Nathan. Uh, our next seminar next week is gonna be by Paola Manzini, who's gonna talk about, about a model of approval. So Nathan, thank you for joining us. Uh, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, so broadly speaking, the matching literature considers settings where agents negotiate agreements with one another. And in particular, it's mainly been focused on settings where these agreements, what the literature calls contracts, are substitutable. So making a new contract available never makes me accept the contract that I previously rejected. They're bilateral, so they only involve two agents, and they don't have externalities. Um, and these assumptions make sense in settings like college admissions, job markets, and supply chains of trading networks. And in these kinds of settings, the literature has been very successful at showing, A, there's going to be an outcome that's stable or robust to deviations by both individuals and groups of agents, and also, B, how to find it. And that's allowed us to apply matching theory to these settings to make a prediction about outcomes. But there are lots of settings where the agreements agents make are multilateral, where they have externalities. Uh, for instance, joint ventures and cartel agreements might involve more than two firms. They also might have externalities on competitors that are not part of the joint venture or cartel, and not just on their payoffs, but on their incentive to make other agreements. Same is true for international treaties. They can involve more than two countries, and they may affect not only the countries that signed the treaty, but others as well. And finally, agreements between legislators to pass a certain version of a bill uh, that we uh, create in legislative bargaining are going to be multilateral when, whenever you need more than two of them to get a bill passed. And we showed in our paper a couple of years ago um, that accommodating contracts that are multilateral or have externalities is straightforward when those contracts are complementary. So when making a new contract available never makes me reject a contract that I previously accepted. But in many settings, in fact, most settings traditionally studied in the matching literature, contracts aren't complementary. Uh, contracts are substitutable. And it turns out in these kinds of settings where contracts are substitutes, it's actually much more challenging to accommodate multilateral contracts or externalities. And in particular, Unlike in the complements case, introducing them causes the standard existence results from the literature for substitutability uh, to fail. We know that's true with externalities, even in a really basic one-to-one -one matching market. And we know that's true with multilateral contracts because they cause an assumption about market structure that's crucial for standard results. Namely, there's an acyclic supply chain of buyers and sellers uh, not to hold. And if we've got both complementarity and substitutability together, well, then we know from the literature that you know, generically, we're not going to have a stable outcome, even when contracts are bilateral and we're working in a classical two-sided setting and there's no externalities. So because of these issues, matching theory, uh, unfortunately, hasn't been able to, hasn't offered a lot of tools for applied work in these contexts with multilateral contracts and externalities. And instead, people doing applied work in these settings often work with different solution concepts that don't have these existence problems uh, because they uh, consider fewer opportunities that, that agents have to change the outcome. And one of these is commonly referred to as Nash and Nash, so Nash equilibrium and Nash bargains. So here the outcome is determined by Nash bargaining between each pair of agents, given the bargains of the other pairs. And this has been the basis of a ton of applied work on topics like merger incentives, health or insurance network formation, and tariff negotiations. What's great is a Nash and Nash outcome always exists, um, but because of the solution concept structure, 
It doesn't consider agents incentives to do things like substituting between suppliers. So, you know, I'm going to substitute from buying stuff from supplier A and start buying stuff from supplier B instead, or changing tariffs on multiple countries at the same time. These new agreements are sort of negotiated uh, sort of independently of one another. And in many settings where agents make agreements with externalities, we can model those settings as network formation environments. And in those settings, it's common to use pairwise stability, which selects networks where there's no incentive to jointly add a single link or individually remove a link, or pairwise mash stability, where there's also no incentive to remove multiple links. And what's great about these concepts is the conditions for existence aren't that demanding. You know, it's pretty pretty common for a uh, pairwise stable outcome to exist. Uh, but that's because they're, consider they're not considering uh, the set of deviations that uh, are considered in matching theoretic stability. Uh, so they don't consider incentives to add multiple links at the same time, which is important if links are complements, or substitute between links, important if they're substitutes. And while there are other network formation solution concepts that do consider these incentives, people have considered that in the network formation literature, uh, the conditions that you need for existence there are significantly stronger. But in our paper, we're going to develop tools so that we can use matching theory to make predictions about these environments with multilateral contracts or externalities without limiting the incentives to add or remove agreements that are considered in the model. And in fact, we're not just going to show how to accommodate contracts that are multilateral or that have externalities. We're going to show how to accommodate arbitrary preferences and market structures, which is something the matching literature hasn't really been able to do before. And we'll do so by answering three questions. First, what goes wrong when we introduce multilateral contracts or externalities? And the answer is basically, that when we take agents' choices from different sets of available contracts and we aggregate them up, the weak axiom or the matching theoretic version of the weak axiom, irrelevance of rejected contracts, is no longer guaranteed to survive. So we have sort of a mass Colel chapter four issue. And that's the only issue created by these features. Our first two theorems show that when the aggregate choice of either two implicit sides or of the entire market satisfies the weak axiom or the relevance of rejected contracts, stable outcomes are going to exist. Second, when can we ensure that that doesn't happen? When can we ensure that choice isn't poorly behaved under aggregation? Well, it turns out that if agents are strategically sophisticated in the sense that at each set of available contracts, they form correct beliefs about what contracts their counterparties will choose from that available set of contracts. And then they choose optimally given those beliefs. Then the weak axiom on their aggregate choice or relevance of rejected contracts amounts to a minor refinement, a mild refinement on those beliefs to eliminate sunspots. Finally, well, suppose, suppose agents are strategically sophisticated. Okay, stable outcomes exist, whatever. What predictions can we offer? What can we say about those stable outcomes? Our main result is going to show that when agents are strategically sophisticated and have reasonable beliefs uh, in the sense that we've eliminated these sunspots uh, and they satisfy a, a minor forward induction criterion that we'll talk about later, the outcomes that are consistent with stability are going to be the largest ones where no individual can directly benefit from rejecting contracts. Now, I do want to know that there are some important environments with multilateral contracts or externalities where people have been able to leverage some additional structure of the environment and show that stable outcomes exist. So we have existence results in the literature that allow for multilateral contracts with a continuum of outcomes. So when the things that agents negotiate over are perfectly divisible, or when the market structure is a forest. So if we graph the contractual relationships and any feasible outcome, uh, it's always going to look like a tree or a series of trees. With externalities is basically two ways the literature has shown stable outcomes exist. Um, one's by weakening the solution concept to rule out deviations unless they're optimal, no matter what others do in response. And the other is in two-sided markets with substitutability, we can get existence by putting some restrictions on uh, the externalities that we allow. 
Uh, and finally, we showed in our paper a couple of years ago that neither of these things matter if contracts are complementary. Uh, but you know, requiring all contracts to be complementary is, you know, it's it's somewhat restrictive. Okay, so we use a mostly standard matching with contracts model. A few things are different that I'll highlight as I go through it. So we've got a set of agents, capital I, it's finite. We've got a finite set of contracts that they can agree to with one another, capital X. Um, each contract is gonna require the agreement of a subset of those agents in order to go into effect. When it requires the agreement of an agent, we call it naming that agent. And we'll label a set of all contracts that name an agent I, X sub I. Likewise, we'll name the set of contracts that don't name that agent, X sub not I. Outcomes in this model are sets of contracts that the agents agree to with one another. So subsets of X, and each agent has a utility function over those outcomes. Now here's the first part where this becomes non-standard. This utility function uh, takes as its domain, you know, two to the X, not two to the X sub I. So it depends not only on the contracts that agent I signs, but also on the contracts signed by other agents. So uh, we allow for externalities. And accordingly, because we allow for externalities, well, obviously, you know, what's, what's going on among the other agents can change the choices of that agent. So when we build uh, this agent's choice function, sort of the building block of matching theoretic stability, instead of having agents' choice functions be choices from a set Y of contracts available to them, they need to be choices from a set Y of contracts that name them, given a set contracts, of, uh, given a set of contracts Z that don't involve them. Um, we're going to assume that there are, that this is a, this is a function, it's not a correspondence. Um, and accordingly, we're going to assume that, you know, conditional on the set of contracts signed by the other agents uh, that I'm not involved in, I'm never indifferent between two sets of contracts. Um, and then just like we labeled the set of all contracts that named agent I, uh, X sub I, we're gonna name, we're gonna label the set of contracts in an outcome Y that name agent I uh, as Y sub I, and likewise the set of contracts in Y that don't name that agent Y sub not I. Finally, before I move on, I wanna note something that's not on this slide. So there's no restrictions here on who contracts can name. So there's no assumption of a two-sided market or an ASIC with trading network, no restrictions on how many agents contracts can name. So we can have multilateral contracts, no restrictions on how many contracts agents can sign. Um, this, is the, you know, this, is, this is the entire model. Okay, so to make our primitive objects mo more concrete, I want to return to the motivating settings I mentioned earlier. So suppose that we're thinking about cartel agreements. We want to think about cartel agreements. So then our set of agents would be a set of monopolistically competing firms. Our set of agreements would be you know, cartels uh, and their levels of output that they've agreed to produce. And then you know, our set of agreements that name an agent I uh, are going to be output agreements for cartels that name that agent. If we want to think about legislative bargaining in this model, our set of agents is going to be a set of legislators. Our set of contracts are going to be the possible agreements they might make to pass a bill. And our set of contracts that name an agent I are going to be agreements that involve legislator I uh, voting to pass this bill. If we want to think about network formation, so uh, you know, a set of agents is going to be the agents of the network. X is going to be links between agents, so they might form with one another. Uh, and then X sub I for each agent I is going to be uh, links between that agent and other agents. Okay, so we're going to consider the standard solution concept from the literature, stability, uh, modified to account for our setting with externalities. So as a standard, our, an, outcome is, an outcome Y is stable, if it is two things. First, it's individually rational. When Y is the available set of contracts, everybody chooses all of the contracts from Y that name them, that they're involved in. Second, it's unblocked. 
So we can't get together with other agents and propose a set of new contracts, Z, that we're, already, that we're all willing to choose when they're offered alongside that existing set of contracts, why? And before I move on, because uh, we have externalities, I wanna note, we have to take a stand on you know, what agents consider when they contemplate a block. So in the literature without externalities, when evaluating a block, agents are gonna consider all existing contracts and all blocking contracts. They're gonna think about both of those. Um, we're gonna extend that treatment to contracts that don't involve them. Uh, so we're going to have Z union Y not I in the second argument of, of our choice function when we think about blocking. Uh, and so some other papers take a different stance uh, where, and have agents only consider the, the existing contracts that don't involve them. So they would have the second argument be Y not I. So just to clarify here. Um... Uh -huh. You're, you're not, the, here the agents are not taking into account uh, when thinking about externalities, the possibility that some of these contracts in Z union Y may not happen, especially some of the existing contracts Y, right? Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, so later, later on, you'll see that they do uh, when we start talking about strategic consistency. Um, you know, here, so you can think of this, uh, so, Okay, you can think of the second argument as representing, um, so th this, is, this is actually a good question. And it, it, the, the answer sort of, you'll, we'll see, depends on the way we choose to uh, define choice functions. Um, so here, you know, these are, these are choice functions and they're saying, okay, when the set of available contracts is Z union Y. So the set of contracts available to others is Z union Y not I, the set of contracts available to me is Z union YI. What do I choose? And then later we'll see, well, okay, it could be that I just think that Z union Y not I is, is going to be what the other agents choose. And it could be that um, I'm, I'm actually going to you know, form beliefs about what they would choose and take that uh, as given when I, when I make my choices. Uh, so we'll see that more uh, when we when we talk about strategic consistency. So just to clarify one more point, uh -huh. so should I think about the second argument of the choice function as representing what contracts other agents actually execute, or what contracts other agents have access to or are thinking about? That's the second one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Nathan, may I interrupt you? Yes, uh, I think that you mentioned, but I'm still struggling with the sure. notation. Okay, so let me see. The way of reading it is that blocking means introducing new contracts. Mm -hmm. so you cannot, you, they, they are sunk. I mean, the, the, the contracts that, that you are considering as a reference point, the white contracts, they are sunk. They cannot be changed. No, so they can be changed, right? Um, so what we're saying is suppose we offer Z alongside this existing set of contracts, Y. Um, and then we can make whatever choices we want. But when we're asking, does this block, all we're saying is, do we choose all of the new contracts we're adding? We can delete contracts that we have currently, we can, we can keep them, we can do whatever we want. Um, the thing that has to happen for Z to block is that Z has to be uh, part of the stuff that we choose. Sorry, Nathan. One, one more point. One small point. You, you mentioned that it was a choice function, not a choice correspondence. Yes. But you have y prime belongs to CI, suggesting it's a set. Oh, I'm missing something. Yeah, that's a that's a typo. Okay, because it's not. That's you you have an equal sign for, in the paper. Thanks for highlighting that. Yep. So it should just be zi subset ci. Uh, Sorry, again, I got confused with notation. Is it a blocking pair or is it a, uni a uni unilateral deviation? So this is a blocking set. Um, so we're considering deviations by groups of agents, not just by pairs of agents. Okay, thanks. So just to try to put that in different words, you're looking at adding contracts that everyone in, in that group that is named in ZI we'd actually choose those contracts. Yes, Is that the exactly. way to put it, yeah. Exactly. Okay. 
All right, so like most existence results in the matching literature, our first two theorems are both going to characterize stable outcomes as a result of the Gale Shapley deferred acceptance algorithm. And the case of our first theorem, that characterization is going to be explicit. Uh, for the second theorem, it's going to be implicit. And actually, we'll see we don't actually need the Gale Shapley algorithm. But the way these algorithms work is we separate in the market into two groups. We have one group choose a set of offers that haven't previously been rejected by the other side. And we have the other group choose which offers they want to keep and which to reject. They offer, so they operate at the aggregate level of these two groups. And so we'll need to introduce the idea of a group's aggregate choice function. In particular, for a group of agents J, the aggregate choice function C sub J is going to take a, contract, a set of contracts Y and then return the subset of Y that no one in J rejects when Y is available. And that function is defined formally as this intersection where each term is the union of the contracts that agent I chooses when Y is available and the contracts he can't choose because he's not involved in them. So each term is going to be the stuff that agent I doesn't reject. When we take the intersection over all of the agents in J, we get the stuff that no one in J rejects from this set of contracts Y. Now, importantly, this is different than how the aggregate choice of either side of a two-sided market is usually defined in the literature. It's equivalent in that setting, but it's you know, usually in a two-sided market, we define aggregate choice of either side as a union. Uh, and the reason we can do that is because there's no contracts that name multiple agents on the same side of a two-sided market. That's what makes it a two-sided market. Here, we're gonna wanna consider the aggregate choice of groups where that's not the case, uh, and you know, multiple agents are, are in fact involved in the same contracts uh, it, within this group. And so it has to be an intersection instead. Finally, sometimes we're going to want to think about the aggregate choice of all the agents in the market. Uh, so group I, uh, when we do that, we just label this function C instead of C sub I. Now, in general, we know from the literature that two conditions on choice sort of more or less have to hold uh, for a generalized Gale Shapley algorithm to work and, and produce stable outcomes. Um, the first is irrelevance of rejected contracts in a two sided market. The first is irrelevance of rejected contracts, or IRC, which says, well, getting rid of contracts that I rejected shouldn't change my choices, or equivalently, my choices are going to obey the weak axiom given whatever I, I think is going on among the other agents. And the second is substitutability, which says that making more contracts available shouldn't make me choose contracts I previously rejected. So this rejection function, RI, which takes as argument the um, set of contracts available and tells me which contracts do I not choose, uh, even though they were available to me, uh, that's gonna be monotone in both arguments. Now, in classical two-sided settings, these conditions only need to hold the level of each individual. And in classical two-sided settings, there's no externality, so we can sort of drop that second argument. But again, Gale Shapley algorithms operate at the level of aggregate choice. So what we really need is for the aggregate choice of each of the two groups in the algorithm to satisfy these conditions. Now, in a classical two-sided market, these conditions are both going to survive aggregation, which is why we only need to rely on them at the individual level. But in our more general setting, that's only true for substitutability. Irrelevance of rejected contracts is not necessarily going to survive aggregation. And it turns out that's the fundamental challenge for standard results created by multilateral contracts and externalities. Now in classical two-sided settings, when we have substitutability in IRC, that allows us to express stable outcomes as the fixed points of the operator for a generalized Gale Shapley algorithm. So the idea here is we have two sides, called them J and K. We initialize the algorithm by giving 
by having side k offer a set z naught to side j. So side j has the set of contracts z naught to choose from. Then we take everything that j didn't just reject, call it y1, and let k choose from that. And then we take everything that k didn't just reject, call it z1, and then we'll have j choose from that. And this process repeats until the algorithm terminates at a fixed point of the Gale Shapley operator f, the function that takes yn and zn and gives us yn plus one and zn plus one. Now in substitutability, this operator is monotone. So we know from Tarski's fixed point theorem, it'll eventually converge to a fixed point. And if these are two sides of a classical two-sided market, the set of contracts that are in both components of that fixed point uh, simultaneously, so they're in the intersection of Y star and Z star, that's gonna be a stable outcome. With multilateral contracts or externalities, we can still do this. Gale Shapley algorithm will, will still work uh, with substitutability, but this time the sides are implicit. Instead of being characterized by how they're by their choices not affecting other agents on the same side, so by agents choosing from completely different sets of contracts, they're now characterized by IRC surviving aggregation. So our first theorem says that if we have two of these implicit sides where IRC holds an aggregate, then the fixed point characterization from the literature still holds and stable outcomes exist. So intuitively with two-sided markets, we know we need IRC at the individual level, but the Gale Shapley algorithm is based on aggregate choice. So what's actually important uh, for, for these Gale Shapley outcomes to be stable is IRC at the aggregate level. Now, when the aggregate choice of the entire market satisfies IRC, we not only don't need substitutability to guarantee existence, we can say that the stable outcome is unique. And we can say specifically what it is. It's a set of contracts chosen by all agents in aggregate from the set of all contracts X, so C of X. And to understand why, consider our previous result on fixed points of our two-sided Gale Shapley algorithm with, with IRC. But this time make it one side by putting all of the agents on the same side. So put everybody in J and put nobody in K. And so K is never gonna reject anybody. Well, if that's the case, then the second component of our Gale Shapley operator, since it's made up of this contracts that, that that side doesn't reject, side K, is just gonna return X no matter what, because K never rejects anything. And when the second argument of the Gale Shapley operator is just a set of all contracts X, so the stuff that, uh, so the, you know, uh, the stuff that, that is never rejected by K, because K never rejects anything, the first component is just gonna return C of X. So our algorithm is gonna converge within two applications to C of X comma X. No monotonicity required, so we don't need substitutability. Um, but what we do need for you know, the intersection of those two arguments, so just C of X, to be stable is IRC. We need IRC on, on, on C. Okay, so stable outcomes exist when IRC survives aggregation, either among all agents or among two implicit sides who view contracts as substitutes. But isn't that kind of demanding? Yes, potentially. In particular, in the matching literature, when choice functions are derived from preferences, they're generally going to take a set of available contracts and return that agent's most preferred subset. And with externalities, that's gonna be the most preferred subset, given that the contracts that we're taking as given for everyone else take effect. So this is, I think, what, what Robbie was asking about earlier. Now it's well known that when it's defined this way, individual choice is always gonna satisfy IRC. But if we aggregate among a group of agents that are involved in or affected by the same contracts as we have to when we have multilateral contracts or externalities, IRC can often fail to survive. So suppose we've got a two, group of two agents and we've got two contracts that name both of them, 
let's call these things X and Y. Let's say agent one likes X better, agent two likes Y better. Neither of them want to sign both contracts and both would rather sign either contract than none. And let's let their choice functions be defined as in the literature and return their most preferred subset of a set of available contracts. If we look at choices when X and Y are available, agent one will choose X, agent two will choose Y. And since both contracts require both agents agreement, the group in aggregate is gonna reject both of them because each was rejected by one of these agents in the group. But suppose we made only X available. Well, then each agent's most preferred subset of X alone, the singleton X, is just X. And so, you know, nobody rejects it. It's chosen in aggregate by the group. Um, but that means that it violates IRC because we got rid of a contract that was rejected by the group. Why? And suddenly our choice is expanded. So this violates IRC. So if we think about it, the failure of IRC. Question. Yep. Yeah. So is this analogous to like the failure of aggregate demand to satisfy revealed preference conditions in like GE, the usual GE setting? Um, so is this, yes. So it's, it's analogous to the failure of, um, it is absolutely analogous to the failure of demand to continue to satisfy the weak axiom under aggregation. Um, because IRC, I mean, it's equivalent to the weak axiom. It's again, basically, you know, it holds at the individual level. We try to aggregate it and it fails. Um, so, and, and, and what I, uh, what I want to talk about though is, and then, but yeah, so, we try to aggregate it and, and it fails. Um, so why does it fail? Well, if we think about it, the failure of IRC to aggregate here stems from some myopic behavior on the part of the agents. So in particular, when they were choosing their preferred subset from X and Y, both were implicitly assuming that whatever set of contracts they chose would go into effect. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to just choose their most preferred subset. But in order to go into effect, the other agent also has to choose them. So really they were implicitly assuming that the other agent would choose both contracts. And obviously this assumption was incorrect. And this led to each of the contracts being rejected by one agent and no contracts being chosen by the two agents in aggregate. But what if agents didn't make these incorrect assumptions? Specifically, what if they were strategically sophisticated in the sense that they form beliefs about others' behavior and those beliefs are correct. And then their choice functions are derived from optimal choice given those beliefs. Well, that will be a different story. We can get IRC to aggregate and we can make predictions even with multilateral contracts and externalities and even without relying on conditions on preferences or market structure. And that's perhaps the biggest insight of this paper. So formally, given their payoffs, what, what do I mean by strategic consistency? So given their payoffs, a group of agents that are strategically sophisticated about each other's behavior are gonna form what we call a strategically consistent assessment. This is gonna consist of two parts. First, choice functions for each of the agents in the group. And second, beliefs for each agent in the group, which are functions that take as an argument the set of contracts that's available and return the set of contracts that the agent believes that the other agents in the group will choose. And for this assessment to be strategically consistent, two things have to be true. First, each agent's belief about what the other agents will choose from any available set of contracts has got to be correct. So mu i of y, set of contracts that we believe that other agents will sign uh, when y is available, has to be equal to the aggregate choice of the group J not I, so the other agents in group J besides agent I from that set Y. Second, choices from any set of available contracts have gotta be optimal given what the agent believes. So the most preferred subset of the contracts naming her 
that she believes the other agents will choose, given the set of contracts that don't name her, that she believes the other agents will choose. Nathan, so this is, yep. So is it, is it correct to interpret these beliefs as sort of like reducing what you can really choose from as individuals? So you have some, but you, yep. you believe that some, some people will not choose some of the contracts that you would potentially like. So you eliminate those and then you choose whatever is best among, among what remains, right? Is this that? Yes, that's that absolutely right. So basically, you know, there's a set of um, contracts that are available. We, you know, somebody proposed them or, or whatever. Uh, and then we think, hmm, uh, what are the other agents going to choose given that this is a set of contracts that are available? And given my beliefs about what other agents are going to do, what, what's optimal for me to reject? What's optimal for me to choose? So this is, this, these assessments are equilibrium objects. And so they generally won't be unique given agents' payoffs. But what will be uniquely pinned down by agent payoffs is the choice functions that are uh, defined the way they are in the literature. So this most preferred subset choice function, uh, which are also gonna be useful to us, it turns out, in characterizing the outcomes that are consistent with stability when agents are strategically sophisticated. And to contrast with strategic consistency, we're gonna call these choice functions myopically consistent. Mm -hmm. Nathan. Yep. I'm sorry, I mean a, a clarification. I mean, can you point out point out for us what is the relationship or the difference with individual rationality? From this what is the difference between individual assessment? rationality? So um, just to be clear, what precisely do you mean by individual individual rationality? Uh, well, what you define as individual mm -hmm. rationality, it's individually rational, you call it that way. So, um, is, is so, oh, so right. So in the, in the definition of stability, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, right. So, uh, individual rationality is a condition once we have choice functions. So this is saying th this, this is about how are a choice functions going to be built from preferences. And then stability says, so the two prongs of the stability definition say, First, you know, given our choice functions, is this set individually rational? So is this something that we all choose uh, when, when it's the set of contracts that's available? And second, is it unblocked? So given our choice functions, is there any other set of contracts C that we could offer alongside this set Y uh, such that you know, when, when it's offered alongside Y, everybody chooses the contracts in Z that name them? Okay, so suppose a group of agents is strategically sophisticated about each other's behavior and their choice functions are part of a strategically consistent assessment. Does that mean that their aggregate choice will satisfy IRC, which is what we want? It turns out the answer is not quite. So for instance, return to our example with two agents and two contracts. And suppose that when both contracts are available, Neither agent believes the other will choose either of them. So we think, oh, X and Y are both available. We're just, we, we believe that the other agent is just not going to choose any contracts. And because that's what they believe, they optimally don't choose any contracts because you know, they, they don't think they can. And those beliefs end up being correct. But when only X is available, they both believe the other agent is going to choose it. And so both optimally choose it because they'd rather sign X than no contracts. And so those beliefs also end up being correct. So these choices and beliefs are compatible with strategic consistency, but the group's aggregate choice is not going to satisfy IRC. Once again, we get rid of Y, which we rejected from X comma Y, and suddenly we choose more contracts. This time it's for a different reason. Instead of making assumptions that are inconsistent with other agents' behavior, which is what was going on previously, well, now these, they're, they're making assumptions that are totally consistent with each other's behavior, uh, but these assumptions are inconsistent 
across sets of available contracts. There's a sunspot. And this suggests a refinement on these assessments to ensure the beliefs are consistent across different sets of available contracts. In particular, we propose that no agent should believe that the other members of the group would change their behavior because of the removal of contracts which are not chosen by any of them, a condition that we call irrelevance of unanimously rejected contracts or IURC. So basically, if, we, if we've got contracts from uh, this larger set Y that no agents choose, and so we remove them, we go down to the smaller set Z that contains what everybody chose from Y. Um, so they, re they reject everything from Y that isn't in Z. And any contract in Y that isn't in Z uh, was, was rejected by some agent in the group. So every contract in Y that doesn't name anyone in group J is also going to be in groups in set Z. Then what we believe about what the other agents in the group choose should be the same at both Y and Z. So we, we shouldn't change our beliefs just because we got rid of some contracts that were rejected by every single person in the group. And our next big result says it is a refinement on strategically consistent assessments. This is equivalent to two things. First, it's equivalent to a refinement on beliefs alone, other than the whole assessment, which it turns out that refinement is just on beliefs alone is just ir irrelevance of rejected contracts as applied to beliefs instead of choice functions. So this says that with strategic consistency, it's equivalent for beliefs to treat unanimously rejected contracts as irrelevant, what IURC is doing, and for them to treat contracts that we think some agent would reject as irrelevant, what's what IARC on beliefs does. And second, it's equivalent to IRC on the group's aggregate choice. So a group's strategic sophistication, together with beliefs that are reasonable in the sense that they satisfy IRC, or equivalently the assessment satisfies IURC, implies that the group's aggregate choice satisfies that all-important IRC condition that we need for our existence results. Okay, so if we've got a strategically consistent assessment, either for each and two implicit sides or for the market as a whole, and beliefs are reasonable in the sense that they satisfy RC, then our theorems that we've shown so far say we've got a stable outcome, at least one. But when can we say that these assessments exist? And what predictions can we make when they do? Our next main result says that if the assessment is for the market as a whole, so each agent is strategically sophisticated about the behavior of all the others, the answers to these questions are always and anything that would be individually rational if we gave agents their myopically consistent choice functions the way they're defined in the literature, these most preferred subset choice functions. And we call those outcomes myopically individually rational. So formally, an outcome is stable. If an outcome is stable for some strategically consistent assessment, it's gotta be myopically individually rational. And if it's myopically individually rational, then it's stable for some strategically consistent assessment with reasonable beliefs, with beliefs that satisfy IRC. So with strategic sophistication among all agents and reasonable beliefs, outcomes are consistent with stability if they're myopically individually rational. So no individually, can directly benefit from getting rid of one of their contracts given the behavior of anyone, everyone else. And since the empty set trivially, trivially satisfies this condition, we've always got to have at least one such outcome that's consistent with stability and strategic sophistication among all agents. Now, this solves our existence problem. But now we've got a lot of outcomes that are myopically individually rational, and some of them 
are supported by assessments that are that might seem unreasonable. So they're stable for assessments that you might think are kind of intuitively not really that reasonable. So for instance, consider our toy example from earlier, two agents, two contracts. And suppose we've got an assessment where neither agent believes the other is ever going to choose any contracts. And so neither agent ever chooses any contracts. Less strategically consistent and beliefs satisfy IRC, but it seems kind of unnatural. In particular, here the empty set of contracts is stable. Um, and so, you know, if an agent proposed a block consisting of the contract X, well, then the other agent's not going to believe that she'd actually sign it. That's why, why the empty set's stable is these kinds of proposals. Um, the, the agents don't find them believable. But a proposal of that, like that, should be credible. No agent can directly benefit from rejecting X, since they both rather have X alone than no contracts at all. And no agent can benefit indirectly by rejecting X uh, in order to create further blocking opportunities that weren't already there, since um, anything that, that blocked X would block the empty set as well. So no agent can, can propose X because they want to create further blocking opportunities because if, if something blocked X, it would block the empty set too. So, you know, this, this proposal should be credible. There's no reason why we propose it if we weren't prepared to go through with it. And so this assessment isn't robust for some very basic forward induction reason. More generally, a blocking proposal that adds contracts should be credible. And so agents should believe that other agents will go along with it. If no agent can benefit from going along with it, instead rejecting some contracts, either directly in the sense that that would create, that would increase their payoffs or indirectly in the sense that it would create new opportunities for further blocks. In particular, if a set of contracts Y is myopically individually rational and beliefs satisfy RC, it must form a credible blocking proposal for any smaller set of contracts. No one can benefit from rejecting some of them Direct, directly by getting a higher payoff. That was, that's what it means to be myopically and visually rational. And no one can benefit from, you know, creating a new blocking up by proposing this and then creating, in order to create a new blocking opportunity that wasn't previously there. Since if a set of contract Z is chosen by all agents in aggregate when it's offered alongside Y, which has to happen for it to block, or for Z not Y to block, aggregate IRC requires that it's also chosen when it's offered alongside any subset of Y. So this forward induction reasoning is captured in a criterion that we call weak forward induction. And formally, weak forward induction says that whenever a set of contracts is offered that's myopically individually rational, so such that no one can directly benefit from rejecting some of the contracts. Uh, everyone should believe that the other agents will choose all of the contracts in that set. And the reason for the weak modifier is that we're only evaluating the credibility of blocking proposals that add contracts. We can give a more complicated criterion, which evaluates the credibility of other blocking proposals that say where, where contracts that are existing end up getting deleted in the same way, but as far as we can tell, the extra predictive power that we get out of that refinement, as far as outcomes are concerned, is usually gonna be pretty limited. So this leads us to our main characterization result. And when it says that the set of stable outcomes that can arise from strategically consistent behavior, when beliefs are both reasonable, in the sense that they satisfy IRC, and robust to forward induction, in the sense that they satisfy weak forward induction, is a set of maximal myopically individually rational outcomes. So the maximal outcomes predicted by our theorem without forward induction. So for intuition, 
Weak forward induction requires agents to believe that all contracts in a myopically individually rational set are actually going to be chosen by the other agents. Consequently, they're all going to choose those contracts uh, from that set. And so that outcome is going to be individually rational under our strategically consistent assessment under those choice functions as well, not just myopically individually rational. That means that it'll block any smaller set of contracts. So only the maximal such outcomes can be stable. Can I make sure I understand here? Sure. Uh, so, so you have that individual rationality, uh, myopic individual rationality condition that gives you existence. And you're saying, well, that's not quite enough. I want to add that additional uh, weak forward induction uh -huh. uh, that sort of narrows down, narrows down the, the set of uh, stable outcomes I'm going to consider. In some sense, I'm, you se you're, um, you're selecting only the best ones, the one that maximizes the number of contracts. But could, could it be that in some sense, all of the stable outcomes are bad? In some sense, could it be that only the one without any contract is the only stable outcome? Yes. So, okay, that's a good that's a good question. So, um, yes, the empty set could be the only outcome that's consistent with stability, either with or without weak forward induction. Um, so, you know, when would that happen? Well, that would happen if it's the only uh, myopically individually rational outcome. So, basically, from any other outcomes, somebody wants to reject one or more of their contracts. So that's when you would get the empty set being the only outcome consistent with stability. Um, so if that's not true, if you have other myopically individually rational outcomes, then you, know, you will have multiple outcomes that are consistent with stability. And what this is saying is only the maximal ones um, are you know, sort of reasonable in the sense that uh, they're sort of robust to agents applying this forward induction reasoning and, and taking credible deviations uh, to add contracts seriously. And when, and when this rules out all of the, I guess, outcomes besides the empty set, well, what, what that means is that, that that can only happen when the empty set is, is the only myopically individually rational outcome. So, you know, basically, you know, there's, there's no, there's no way you can you can ever get agents to sign more contracts uh, because if you have a larger set of contracts, somebody wants to get rid of some of them. So for an illustration one of other, our- One other clarifying question. Uh -huh. If you take an uh, outcome that's stable in like the myopic old sense, mm -hmm. is that always the maximal Myopically IR outcome. I mean, the yes. IR part is by definition. Yes. The maximality is also true. Yes. So that's that's going to be part of our our next result. Or uh, yeah. So yeah. So this is we'll we'll show in a moment that this is never going to um, this is never going to rule. If if we have predictions about stable outcomes from the literature, this result is never going to overturn those predictions. It's only ever going to expand the set of outcomes that can be consistent with stability by allowing by thinking about strategic sophistication. So for an illustration of the power of this result, consider the classical roommate problem from Gale and Shapley, 1962. So there's in this example, there's three friends that I'll call one, two, and three. And they're deciding which two of them are going to room together. Only two of them can room together. So the contracts are agreements between one and two, between two and three, and between three and one to room together. So X12, X23, X31. And each of those agreements names the agents that would be rooming together. And each agent prefers rooming with the next agent in the sequence modulo three to rooming with the last agent in the sequence modulo three, and prefers rooming with either of them to living alone. And none of the agents can sign multiple roommate agreements um, this, say that sends their utility to something really large negative. So with myopically consistent choice, if we, if we take you know, each agent's most preferred subset of the contracts available to them uh, as a standard in the literature, and then we, we look at uh, what's stable, the classical result is that there's no stable outcome. Agent one would rather live with two than three, and so X12 blocks X31. 
and two would rather live with one than alone. Uh, so, so x12 blocks x31. Similarly, x23 is going to block x12. And the agreement between three and one is going to block the agreement between two and three. And of course, everything blocks the empty set since agents would each rather be matched with anyone than unmatched. But even though this is a classical result, um, it seems like it might be a little bit inconsistent with reality. After all, you know, in the real world, people find roommates. And that's what our main result says, is that actually with strategically sophisticated agents that have beliefs that are reasonable and robust to forward induction, any of these roommate agreements is going to be consistent with stability. Why? Why, why what, what's going on here under the hood in these assessments? So basically, with strategic sophistication, agents might not be willing to leave to match with a different agent if they believe that the new agent they matched with would then leave them. So for instance, let's consider a particular strategically consistent assessment with belief satisfying RFC and weak forward induction, where a roommate agreement between one and two is stable, where everybody believes that if uh, this agreement between one and two is available, the other agents that it names choose it. Everybody believes that if it's not available, but the agreement between three and one is available, the other agents that that agreement names will choose it. And if the agreement between two and three is the only one available, then agents two and three will choose it. And then we just say, well, let's, let's have agents choose uh, whatever they believe, uh, whatever contracts they believe the others will sign that name them. Um, that's the optimal thing for them to do because they don't want to be unmatched. Um, and so you know, these beliefs end up being correct and uh, choice is optimal. So this assessment is strategically consistent. So here, Agent two is not willing to leave agent one to match with agent three, she prefers, because he doesn't believe that that's actually, that if he did agree to that, he doesn't believe that it would actually end up happening. He believes maybe agent three would then leave him to go match with agent one. Uh, sorry, I may, I may ask here. So if we do look at this from the perspective of farsighted coalitional stability, so it yeah. turns out that they count only like one step ahead, right? So I believe I believe that things would go wrong, uh, but I don't count what happens after that, after and after and after and so on, right? So it's so we don't have an explicit, um, yeah. So so the comparison with far side stability, so that that's kind of somewhat what what how we can interpret this. We don't have an explicit, um, you know, far-sightedness uh, criterion that we're applying. Um, we're just trying to to interpret what's going on in this assessment. So th this is just an interpretation, I guess I should say. But but you know, so so I, I think I think the answer is um, no. We we don't have a, a explicit far-sighted uh, way of thinking about this. Thanks. So, in, so when the literature offers predictions about stability without strategic sophistication, how does our main result compare to those predictions? So this addresses Robbie's question. Well, with complementarity, so monotonicity of the standard myopically consistent choice function in both arguments. It's identical. So we showed in our paper a couple of years ago that in these settings with standard myopically consistent choice functions, there's a unique largest individually rational outcome, and that's the unique stable outcome. And the reason is that anytime it matters, so anytime we're thinking about a potentially successful block of something individually rational, implicitly assuming that the other agents are going to sign all of the available contracts, which is what happens with myopically consistent choice, that turns out to be correct anytime that it matters with complementarity. And it's actually for this reason that we can accommodate multilateral contracts and externalities in that result without requiring IRC at the aggregate level. In fact, not requiring IRC at the individual level. More generally, in settings where the literature gives predictive results about stability with myopically consistent choice functions, 
allowing Asians to be strategically sophisticated is never going to overturn those predictions. It's still going to be among the outcomes predicted by our main result. For intuition, observe that it's if, if an outcome is stable when choice is myopically consistent, it's got to be myopically individually rational, since individual rationality is a component of stability. And if there's any larger individually rational set of contracts, or any larger myopically individually rational set of contracts, then when choice functions are, are given by these myopically consistent choice functions, the contracts in that larger set that aren't in Y, uh, this outcome that's stable when, when choice is myopically consistent would block Y. All right, um, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and conclude there. Um, a little bit, about two minutes over. I know Robbie has somewhere to be, so thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, Nathan, uh, for your talk. It's now time that we open uh, the Q and A session. So let, let's start with the with the panelists. Uh, Ravi, uh, David, who do you want to start? I don't know. David, for instance, do you want to do you have any final question or comment? Um, sure. But perhaps one thing I can do is try to um, give my understanding of reading the paper or interpret it, and perhaps Nathan can then correct what what is not correct about it or put some uh, more perspective. Sure. I, I find it useful to maybe even for you, Nathan can be useful to see how people sort of understand your paper when when reading it. Uh, so to, to go back to the origin of matching theory, things work really nicely when we have these, you know, standards, uh, say marriage market, we have stability, it all works nicely. Then we realize we can extend this uh, as long as we have substitutability, that's that sort of two-sided substitutability that works nicely. Um, but we, for a long time, thought of once we, once we had once we had some complementarity, then everything sort of falls apart. And Nathan, with uh, actually the same co-author, uh, showed a couple of years ago that with just complementarity, it actually works reasonably nicely. Uh, it's really when you have those mix between substitutability and and um, and uh, complementarity across contracts that things don't tend to not not work out so well. Um, and and in, in particular, once you start, even simple models, once you start adding those, those externalities, uh, which is something that often happens, but that we tend to ignore in matching markets because we just don't know how to deal with them, uh, th things tend to tend to fall apart. And I think what, what is really nice here is that it gives us a way to think about uh, how things can actually work with, with externalities and how we could actually potentially uh, design matching markets where uh, where those situations, uh, those those issues occur, where you might, for example, care about uh, who is going to who are going to be your classmates, uh, who else is going to uh, to contract with whoever you're contracting, and and, and things like this. Um, so it's sort of in in a broad sense. Uh, to me, this is what I'm getting from that paper. I'm sorry, Nathan, if I'm if I'm missing some of the um, the main points here. Uh, but to me, this is really sort of what was what really jumped at me at, at, as something really new here that might actually open new perspectives for for what we're trying to do, even from potentially an applied perspective. I mean, I, I think that's. I mean, I think that's totally a reasonable takeaway. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, so the this, you know. Uh, we haven't really thought about how the sort of strategic consistency, I guess, aspect of it, I guess, works with with when when these markets are are being uh, designed. Um, so I, but yeah, I, I guess, yeah, th thank you, and uh, yeah, I think that's a that's a reasonable um, takeaway from it is that yeah, so what. You know, part of this paper is allowing for externalities um, in in traditional matching markets and two side that have two sides um, for sure. And you know, we can also you know go beyond that and think about you know what about like legislative bargaining or network formation or settings where agents are forming agreements and they've got externalities from downstream competition. So they're going to sort of form agreements with one another and then compete in a product market. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's totally uh, a, a fair takeaway, or a one one fair takeaway. 
maybe I could also ask. So I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, oh, thanks. I think it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, approach to um, very original as well approach to thinking about these matching problems. Uh, and I think it has uh, quite a bit of potential in terms of expanding the domains in which we can use the ideas, some of the ideas from matching theory. So I guess my main question is, I'm is I'm trying to think about, you know, how does uh, this, uh, the concept that you're describing mm -hmm. or the, the, that you introduce uh, compare with the, with the classical stability concept in, in like, say, the standard many-to-one or even many-to-many -many matching markets with substitutes? Uh, I guess in the context of your and Mazena's earlier paper, it stability with strategic sophistication coincides with myopic stability. Mm -hmm. But how much do you have a sense about how much weaker uh, this strategic sophistication stability is than the than the classical stability concept, like in say, in the context of, say, residency matching problems or school choice problems? Or yeah, so, so that's a good question is, is when you when you allow choice to be part of it to be uh, part of a strategically consistent assessment. So when you, you allow for strategic sophistication. Um, so I guess the answer is, you know, I, I don't think we really have a sense of how much weaker it gets. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, so I think that, you know, if, if you think about, uh, the outcomes that are going to be myopically individually rational. Um, so this is this is a pretty large set, even if we only restrict to set of maximal myopically individually rational outcomes. So even if we apply our sort of forward induction refinement. Um, so I, my sense would be, you know, this is going to be in in your in a in a in a classical marriage model. My sense would be it would probably be somewhat larger, like meaningfully larger. Um, for sure, but as far as you know, do we have a result that that tells us, um, you know, exactly how much larger it's going to be? Um, I I don't think we do. That's one really nice thing about your approach is even if you think that uh, this is too weak of a solution concept, you can always introduce refinements yes. or for some further refinements on uh, on what types of beliefs are allowed. Exactly. Uh, in order to define the solution concept as well. Exactly. Uh, I think that maybe that's one of the really nice uh, methodological points about separating choices and beliefs. Um, yeah, like that's that's definitely, I don't think we, I don't think we talk too much about that in the paper, but yeah, so we, we definitely think that like, you know, we, we don't think that weak forward induction is like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the re best refinement about on these beliefs uh, and, you know, the, the sort of right refinement, um, but it was the right refinement for this paper. Um, and so hopefully, uh, you know, you know, the, ho hopefully, hopefully someone, uh, we, we hope that, uh, that, that there are future, um, that there's future work in, in the area of, of thinking about other refinements that we could apply to these beliefs um, to kind of pin down these outcomes more. Uh, maybe we should explore some of the, the structure of the model. And that could also be context dependent, right? Your model is extremely wide and applies to a wide range of things. Yeah. Uh, perhaps depending on looking at something more narrow, you might have a refinement that, that could be a particular appropriate. Exactly, so, um, so we don't consider we don't explicitly consider transferable utility in the paper, although um, you know the main issue with that is I think you have to move beyond choice functions and think about correspondence as that. Um, but uh, I mean, the you know we 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 feel like you you could use this approach to think about transferable utility, um, but and then you know because tr transferable utility imposes a, a certain structure. Uh, maybe that allows for a, uh, a, a finer refinement uh, than, than what we have here that exploits that structure. From a technical, you're mentioning correspondence. From a technical point of view, would it really make things a lot harder if you could have, if you could have ties and, and then the choice function become a choice correspondence? Yeah, I don't think it would. 
Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure it would. Um, and, you know, I guess, so the, the question would be, so then, you know, if you allow choice function, if you, if you have choice correspondences instead of choice functions, um, so uh, then, you know, what are, what are beliefs? Um, you know, are they, do we replace the equal sign with a, with an inclusion? Um, do we say, oh, actually, you know, with indifferences, well, we're choosing something. So do we find, do we define the, the correctness part of strategic consistency with an inclusion? Um, I mean, yeah, so I, I, I don't, I don't think any of this is particularly like, you know, yeah, I, I don't think it would be difficult in a technical sense, but I, you know, we, we made the choice not to do that because we, we thought it would make the paper a little bit less clear. Any, any other question? I mean, I have a question. Sure. So let me see. So, I mean, if I understand it right, basically you're proposing uh, or you're expanding the set of solutions that we can consider for um, for um, for these coalitional coalitions of contracts that can be implemented in reality. So of course, I mean, one possibility could be to introduce refinements, no, to to select among all the ones that satisfy your criteria. Okay, to use refinements to make the set smaller. But alternatively, what I was missing in your presentation is examples in which beyond substitutability, okay, we have uniqueness. I mean, reasonable settings in which maybe we have a, we could even have a conjecture. What would it be the outcomes that are, the contracts are going to be implemented and whether stability is useless in that case. And your proposal actually gives a unique prediction that turns out to be the one that perhaps is consistent within our intuition. Okay, so let me make sure I understand. So you're asking, um, you know, is there, is there an example where, you know, we have a we have substitutability, maybe, you know, maybe this is a classical two-sided market. Um, and the- Sorry, I mean, I mean, sorry, I meant complementarity. So I just realized- Oh, okay. Mistake. Oh, sorry, sorry. So yes, I, I missed it up, sorry. Okay, yeah. so what's an example of a market with, of, a, of an environment with complementarity where this gives a unique prediction? Um, so the example that we give is in, um, in our paper about complementarity, one of the examples that we give, the main example for the, the NTU case is um, suppose that uh, we, are, we are agents on a social media website like Facebook and you know, we're, we're forming links with one another. These are, I guess, friend links and um, and we think about you know, our incentives to, to form this link. So if we, if we form this link, there's like a privacy cost uh, because now this person can see all of our, all of our posts. Um, but you know, we, we benefit by seeing the posts of this other person and we benefit uh, because we are, are uh, because this person is going to see our posts. And in particular, uh, that, that causes us to spend more time on Facebook. So we see more posts, we see, um, we, we make more posts and that raises the benefit that we would get from other links if we were to make them. Um, and so there's this sort of natural complementarity between links there. And what this is saying and what, what we, we use this as an, as an example in our other paper, but it also works here. So the, the unique stable outcome is going to be um, or the unique stable network is going to be the network uh, or is going to be the largest network where nobody wants to uh, delete the link. It's the largest individually rational network. And you know this this result sort of extends that uh, you know that, that maximal myopically individually rational result to settings that don't necessarily have, Complementary, uh, and that not only you know says okay we can we can think about these settings now and you apply matching theory to them, um, it also makes it really easy to compute the predictions of this theorem. Um, so we don't have to 
you know, so in some of the, in, in environments like free trade agreement formation. So, you know, like there's, there's a, there's a computational issue when you start having a lot of countries um, with computing, like, okay, are, is there, a, are, are there profitable deviations uh, for this group of countries? And this, this says, well, you, you actually only need to think about, um, you know, what, what sets of free trade agreements are myopically individually rational for different countries. Um, and then, and then that's your, your set of predictions. So it, it maybe uh, increases the, the computational or our ability to, to compute these outcomes in an applied sense as well. So, so I think it's, it's we are already one, uh, one hour and 15. So it's time to, to finish the official part of the seminars. I mean, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, uh, Ravi and David. Okay, for your presence. Thank you, the audience. Uh, so we stop the recording and we're going to stay just a few minutes for informal for informal talk. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.